there's a whole lot of naming going on in this small passage of scripture that we're going to read together today. But there's an importance to the fact that there is a lot of naming going on. And we're going to discover why that's so important in just a moment as we continue our study in the book of Genesis. Hi, I'm Pastor Jeremy Bannister of Heights Christian Church, and we're going through the Bible in five years period of time. If it's always been a goal of yours to go through the Word of God, we invite you on this journey with us by subscribing to our channel and clicking the bell for notifications. You're going to receive a devotional much like this one. We'll read just a little bit of the scripture together and pull one thing from it to be more like Jesus. Well, in the United States, we have things called copyrights or patents, and and they're designed to protect people's intellectual property or, or their ideas from being stolen by somebody else. And so if you have a patent for a product that you've created, you have the right to be able to use that product in, in the way that you have created. That means you can name it, you can market it in, in whatever way possible. If you have created something that you have written, and you have a copyright on it. That copyright protects that uh, intellectual investment that you have poured into In other words, the book that you have written or the short story or the poem, it has the name that you've designated. It has the style of writing that you've put on it. You're the one who gets to create the characters and say what that story is supposed to say. It is your creative license. Well, as we jump into Genesis chapter 2, we get a lot of naming going on because God is creating and God is using his creative license to both give that that um, privilege that is his and his alone to name certain things to Adam as well as naming things himself that he has created. And he defends that through Jesus and his ministry. We're going to talk about that as we dive in together. But let's continue by finishing up chapter 2 of Genesis together in this microcosm of the sixth day of creation. Let's take a look. Then the Lord God said, It is not good that the man should be alone. I will make him a helper fit for him. Now out of the ground the Lord God had formed every beast of the field and every bird of the heavens and brought them to the man to see what he would call them. And whatever the man called every living creature, that was its name. The man gave names to all the livestock and to the birds of the heavens and to every beast of the field. But for Adam, there was not found a helper fit for him. So the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man, and while he slept, took one of his ribs and closed up its place with flesh. And the rib that the Lord God had taken from the man he made, he formed, uh, and the rib that the Lord God had taken from the man he made into a woman and brought her to the man. Then the man said, "This at last is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman." because she was taken out of man. Therefore a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. And the man and his wife were both naked and were not ashamed. And so what we see in this passage of Scripture are are a number of things. Number one, we see that God has created all these animals. And so he has taken every beast of the field and every bird from heaven that he's created and brought them to man. And he's given man the privilege to name these animals. And whatever the name that, that, that Adam had given the animals, that's what their name would be. Now, that creative privilege was totally God's, but he gave it to Adam. And he said, all right, this is mine to do with what I will. I give it to you. You are to name these animals, and whatever you name them, that's what they'll be called. Okay? But in the process of this, Adam, there's not found a suitable helper. And so God then creates Eve. You know, we talked about Adam's creation. We talked about the order of it and how it's not contradictory to Genesis chapter 1 yesterday. But today we're looking at the rest of this creation account. And that that creation account says, after all these animals have been named and been brought to him, there's not a suitable helper. God puts to him a deep sleep and he takes a rib out and he forms a woman. And he breathes life into this woman, and now she is called woman. And so the other thing that is established here is we see man and we see the suitable helper woman. And then this incredible statement, you know, that that is uttered by Adam's mouth. This is at last is bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. 
and the declaration that says, Therefore, a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. We see the establishment of marriage, the definition of marriage, the definition of family, as we get the titles of mother and father in this, uh, this same pronouncement. Um, so we get the definition of husband and wife, and they shall become one flesh. This is the definitive definition because the one who created this union is God. And God is the one who gets to name what this union is and how this union comes to be. And this is defended by Jesus during uh, his earthly ministry here on earth. If we look in Matthew chapter 19, he's challenged by the Pharisees on this very count concerning divorce. And we're gonna, not going to dive into divorce today because Jesus takes a little bit more time in this passage. But we're going to go back to see what Jesus talks about concerning his definition of what marriage is. So let's take a look. Matthew chapter 19, verses 3 through 6. And the Pharisees came up to him and tested him by asking, Is it lawful to divorce one's wife for any cause? And he answered, Have you not read that he who created them from the beginning made them male and female? And said, Therefore man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh? So they're no longer two, but one flesh. What therefore God has joined together, let not man separate. Uh, it's, It's an interesting phraseology that Jesus talks about there. He goes back to Genesis and he says, you know, this whole idea of divorce, this is not the way that God designed it. So if we go back to the beginning, back to here in the garden, back to this account where marriage was brought into being and the two become one flesh. He then says, what God has joined together, let not man separate. In other words, the idea of of this divorce for any and every reason that the Pharisees were bringing before Jesus was not a God-made reason, number one. And number two, it wasn't designed to be that way from the beginning. And therefore, the establishment and definition of marriage only holds to the one who created it, and that would be God. Jesus reaffirms that in the New Testament. And so what do we need in order to have a marriage under God's sight? Because he's the one who's created marriage. It's the definitive definition at the exclusion of every other definition. So our world around us wants to have a lot of man-made definitions for marriage. But I would believe that Jesus would say that God is the one who gets to define that because God is the one who's created that. And therefore, when we look at that, we see, we see a man and a woman united to become a family, to create that next generation who will then become mothers and fathers, whose sons and daughters, when they marry, they will, they will leave and cleave to their wife. Right, And so we have this established order of marriage and what that does in the creation of the family and the next generation of families where we get the definition of mother and father and husband and wife. These have real meanings because God is the one who's created those meanings to mean something. We cannot then redefine it to mean something else. And so for us as believers in Christ who believe the word of God to be true, that is God's actual definition of what marriage is. And there's no other definition that can be accepted that would be accepted in God's sight because all that would be is man manipulating the words that God has used to try and create something that God didn't create to be called marriage. There's only one type of marriage and it's found here in Genesis 2. Let that be an encouragement for you today as we hear so many alternative definitions and theories of what marriage is or possibly could be. There's only one definition. That definitive answer is given by God because he created it right there in the garden for all of us to both see, wonder, and most importantly, honor. And I pray that helps you today and I pray that helps me today to honor marriage as God has designed it. God bless you and we'll talk with you again next week.